Hello, I'm Justin Stanton, editor of BIM Plus and contributor to Construction Management. As part of the Digital Construction Summit 2023, we staged a webinar with Cohesive about ESG in the construction industry. Among the panelists was former government construction advisor, Paul Morell, OBE. Paul was unable to attend the webinar live, so over Zoom, we recorded David Philp interviewing Paul and screened a 10 minute clip during the webinar. That clip focused on ESG, but the full interview covers more ground, including greater focus on industry transformation and how the industry should relate to government. It's an honest and frank interview. It's always worth listening to what Paul has to say, and with his permission, here is that interview at full length. Paul, thank you for joining us today on our webinar. And thinking about it, you know, it's perhaps the most challenging time for industry. There's maybe a perceived need to really redraw how our built environment supports planetary thriving. And I think this week alone, we see, you know, this is playing out in the backdrop of, you know, real life crises, safety use cases, and indeed aging infrastructure. At the same time, we're hearing well, maybe a perception that, you know, stakeholders, especially investment community, you know, start to inform more and more decisions based on terms of environment, social and governments or ESG credentials. Do you think that's true? You know, is construction sector really thinking really proper about ESG on the backdrop? Is it other things that are keeping, you know, especially key stakeholders awake at night? I'm sure it's the latter, that there are other things keeping people awake. I mean, you're quite right. The, the context is extraordinarily challenging. Um, even economically good times, it would be challenging. Uh, and if you think about the things that are pressurizing boardrooms, you know, against the background of once again, it looking as if it's going to be hard to get work, that will be their first priority. If you can get work, it, um, although our usual problem is the moment at which we switch from not being able to get work to not being able to get people, we might be in a time when we can't get either. Uh, and, and if you if you uh, finally manage to secure an adequate load, the next priority is to go out and find the people to do it. Uh, we have the whole building safety agenda bearing down both on balance sheets and on priorities in businesses. We have a huge number of, 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 of social uh, matters around diversity, gender, uh, uh, challenging in, in, on the human relations side. Uh, and then we have the, the matter of climate change, which should, of course, be our, our first priority. But for a business, you know, how we make it a first priority it is a really you know, almost desperate uh, uh, situation because I actually don't see uh, an increase in the ESG uh, agenda uh, just at the moment. I, I remember talking to a client two or three years ago, and I remember him saying to me, a, a responsible developer, uh, for whom I have enormous respect. He said to me, he thought the ESG agenda was the fastest growing issue for businesses uh, in his working lifetime. Uh, and more recently, uh, even he acknowledged it's kind of drifted away. Um, so so they uh, increasingly, some uh, investors are divesting of investments that were bought for ESG reasons uh, because they clearly don't perceive the market valuing them adequately. And their first priority is, is to their uh, depositors or uh, investors or pensioners or whatever, whoever's interest they're protecting. So, yeah, it's an enormously challenging time, even before you get to you know, the, the so-called uh, uh, cost of living crisis. And, and, and those two things are linked. You know, I, I think in the end, uh, people respond to a sense of public opinion. Do their customers really care enough to pay for or, or make any kind of uh, sacrifice, probably an overdramatic word, but, but giving up anything uh, in, in return for uh, an environmental improvement, uh, or will they pay more for it? And increasingly, I think the sense is that just at the moment, people won't. So uh, to me, the whole issue, though, is how we get this back as a, as a key driver. Uh, it has to start to a degree in Whitehall. You know, um, Stern famously said this was the biggest market failure in history. Although we seem to expect government to do almost everything for us, the one thing we must surely agree is that they have to step in when there's a market failure. So I'm concerned. Um, and when I look back at the position we were in 10 years ago, when I was briefly in Whitehall, we knew then what we had to do. 
we had a, I would say, genuinely a globally uh, uh, world leading position. And really, I could weep when I look at how little progress we've made and how much economic, national economic benefit we've given up as a consequence of not pursuing the agenda at pace then. And we seem to be repeating the issue now. So the, the economics of it um, are, are threatened. You know, we are uh, losing opportunity. Um, and above all, of course, the, the environmental and social need for a cleaner, uh, lower carbon environment is still drifting. So that's a slightly, well, I hope we come on to more positive things about how we <laughs> might, might uh, uh, bring about some change. But just at the moment, uh, I find it hard to buy into the idea that, uh, uh, picking up on your question, that more and more stakeholders are demanding environmental responsibility uh, on the part of those they invest in. Do you think one of the big challenges, Paul, is that it's often not relatable? Do you think we have to create a better line of sight to the everyday challenges, assurance, safety use cases? You know, is ESG seem to be the, this big thing that people really don't understand how it can improve service performance, it can actually support, if you like, better societal outcomes for our built assets. Do, do you think we have to reframe the value proposition, make it more relatable? Yes, and um, we have to look at the different interests of different, we now call stakeholders. Um, so, you know, the, the extent to which genuinely one, one's staff and pe one's people expect social responsibility and environmental responsibility needs to be tested and reasserted. Um, because although young people are famously expected to be um, more demanding of, of some kind of responsibility on that front, they're also consumers. You know, and, and the young people I know want the latest everything um, in parallel with wanting uh, increased protection for the planet. So we have to reframe that conversation with, with our own people and get them on side. But above all, we have to persuade society, you know, consumers, uh, voters, uh, investors, uh, that we not just that we face a crisis, because that, that seems to be pretty clear to me, but also there's one we can do something about, uh, even if only on the precautionary principle of, you know, um, if we act as if it matters and it doesn't matter, that doesn't matter. But if we act as if it doesn't matter and it does matter, that really does matter. You know, I, I like that principle generally across um, motivations for people to act. Um, so we, we need to, to, yes, reframe the conversation, bring it back to the front of priorities, but above all, show how... Um, we could actually make a change. And although people will repeatedly say, um, well, you know, we're, we're, we're not a big country. Uh, if we eliminated our, our, our emissions, it wouldn't make a huge difference to the global position. It would at least establish a, a, a high ground from which to encourage others to follow. And I think you can just all keep waiting for each other to act. So 10, 12, 13 years on from knowing what we ought to be doing, we're doing a tiny proportion of it, and the drivers for it you know, need to be revived uh, politically and socially, uh, and in all the relationships that the business is involved in. You mentioned that cadence, that you know the pool. We see many policy goals out, out there just now that it's asking us to change. We talk about how, especially digital tool, if we tool up, it might help us. If there, do, do you think then? You mentioned you know probably since over a decade now since we saw the first government policies come out. You, you mentioned behavioural change, Paul. Do you think we're doing enough in terms of, if you like, the, the remapping, call it you want that, redrawing, in the context of organisational change? I.e., you know, are we making the lifestyle changes that we need as departments, as asset owners, to actually, you know, drive towards these policy goals? Not at any corporate level that I've seen. You know, I, I, of course, I, I, do, I do meet and I know friends who, you know, um, are changing their lifestyle in response to a genuine belief, particularly those with, with young children, you know, belief that they shouldn't sit on jets, shouldn't be eating meat, you know, wh whatever, or make some kind of contribution to it. So I do see people uh, um, and know people who are changing their lifestyle, who wouldn't dream of owning a car, uh, only travel on public transport and so on. Um, but I don't see any translation of that to a corporate belief that the whole market is moving in a way that makes it worth going uh, wholeheartedly for environmental responsibility as a business driver. 
Um, and uh, I think at an industry level, and I feel the same way about building safety, by the way, um, we need to be very clear that we could have a plan. You know, I think we do sit and watch government and wait for government to act on things. And in the context of building safety, which I've been much involved in the last couple of years, um, I do say to the industry, if you're waiting for, ind for government to tell you what a safe building is made of, uh, and, and how you uh, treat a product to make sure that it's safe um, out of the factory and in use uh, and in everything in between. I've not met anybody in White who can answer those questions. And why would they? Uh, and uh, even in, since the period that I was in, in, in uh, Whitehall, there's been a huge loss of resources there, a huge loss of, of corporate knowledge. Every question that gets asked of government seems to me to be as treated as if it's the first time it's ever been thought of. Whereas 10 or 12 years ago, somebody would say, well, we looked at that, you know, and, and this is what we decided then, and has anything changed? Now everything starts from scratch, and there's no resource. So, so I think we need to be very clear as an industry, you know. And although I don't like the kind of Godzilla idea of buildings go around, you know, emitting uh, uh, carbon like some kind of kind of uh, uh, unearthly creature, you know, they are responsible for carbon because that's where we live, that's where we are. You know, when we're not on transport or at work, we're in our homes. Uh, so buildings. Uh, are no more responsible for carbon emissions than beaches are responsible for the use of suntan lotion. You know, they're, they're where people are uh, and where they behave as they do. I still think, nonetheless, the industry could, could look at where its carbon is, which we did 10, 12 years ago, um, and on a very simple principle say, you know, look, whatever strategy you might have, measure what your output is now and reduce it. And these are the things that you could do to reduce it. Um, and start to, to to drive that into our customers' uh, expectation. Um, ask professionals, you know, do you really think you should be producing buildings that are damaging to the environment? Uh, um, and as a digression, I remember a lecture series from somebody who had been around the world lecturing on uh, um, environmental protection. And an engineer that I respected, I, I did say to him, you know, at, at his final lecture, um, what do you do when a client just doesn't want to buy what you're selling? You say, you know, you should produce a sustainable building and you define sustainable as in whichever way you can, but critically in, in, in reducing carbon, both in, in embodied use and in operational use. What do you do? And his answer was, well, well we have to eat. That's an honest answer. Yeah. But if you ask an engineer what would happen if a, if a, a client said to be perfectly happy with a structurally unsafe building, he wouldn't surely say, well, we have to eat. He'd say, well, we can't do it. So it still isn't really an imperative amongst the professions and, and amongst business. But it could be. You know, the profession simply decided that it is unprofessional, it's unethical to produce buildings that don't meet a certain standard. Then the question is, what are the standards? Um, and you could get a long way, I think. And a lot of the bones of this exist. I'll come back to the problem with, with the bones of it. But, you know, the, the CLC does work on this. You know, Green Building Council does work on this. You know, there are groups all around that do work on this. We, we have the bones of a plan, but we don't really have the, the conviction to proceed with uh, implementing it. If we had a co coherent plan that had universal buy-in, then the message to government would be, we can do this. This would be the impact. But this is what you have to do. We should be very limited. And it almost certainly will have to involve regulation, which, of course, you know, the absence of regulation is behind many of our problems at the moment. To get to that position, though, we have to remove the competitiveness from the way this industry acts about everything. You know, that, that everybody who produces a report demands that, it's, that you know, their name is stamped big on the cover. Uh, no, that anybody else who wants to join in has a, may have be allowed a smaller logo. But at no point do we get to the stage where this is the industry plan for this subject. And my dad taught me when I was very young, um, you know, many life lessons that I've carried with me. But one of them was there's very little in this life that you can't achieve if you don't mind who gets the credit. You know, the credit has to be a, a collective one and to bring those plans together and to be much tough, tougher with government. To say, we want to do this. We can do this. We know how to do it. And by the way, the economic opportunities involved in it uh, not just at home, but internationally. 
I'm enormous because if you if you believe the science, and frankly, if you don't, you're an idiot. I mean, the science isn't over, but I'm not aware of a single peer-reviewed scientific paper that argues against the scientific consensus on climate change. If you believe that, then you must believe that in, in the end, everybody's going to have to act, even if it's only reactively and 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 in crisis. The opportunities are huge, um, so you need to reframe it as a combination of the consequences of not acting and the benefits of acting uh, and to do so collectively and to to change our relationship with government from what are you going to do what do you want us to do when well, you know, why don't you do this into this is what we will do what i used to call in my whitehall days something for something if you did this we could do that so that's a very long-winded answer to your question yes we need to reframe uh, in all our relationships as a business uh, with our staff, with our investors, with our customers, with, you know, um, and with our regulators, we need to reframe the relationship and to, 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 to have an absolute agreement, you know, that you, you almost need, um, you need a register of people <laughs> who are misbehaving um, uh, and those who are behaving. We're a long way from it, I think. So, so as Paul, we, we, we can't rely upon the pool. You know, government's got you know many policies out there, but you know maybe it's a bit like BIM level two. There's not any consequences there. There may be soft targets within there, and actually we need to make sure that the the push is equally as strong and to create some degree of a you know of a consensus. Do you you know we're seeing probably in the last ten years a huge amount of adoption in terms of both new technologies. It's probably gone beyond BIM as well now. We're starting to see machine learning coming into play were the early days of artificial intelligence, you know, in terms of that are starting to offer, you know, some degree of ESG. Are, are, do, you, do you think it's real? Do you think we are starting to see technologies now? I wouldn't say improving upon things, but do you think we're getting a better, something you mentioned, Paul, are we getting at actually understanding the baseline? Can we really measure, you know, our carbon or ESG impact on not just the new assets, but especially existing retained estate? Are you seeing that push from the supply chain? I, I, I'm, I'm not particularly seeing the push, but I'm seeing the tool. You know, uh, and it's, if you had a plan, then the questions would be, okay, well, do we have the, do we have the methodologies? Uh, uh, you know, what are, we, what are we trying to do? We're trying to reduce carbon. Do we know where the carbon is? Uh, again, both in body terms and operational terms. Do we have methodologies for deciding how you trade one against the other? Um, you know, we've got the example of the of the MS Korean in Oxford Street. Uh, I absolutely do not know the rights and wrongs of that. Uh, but what I do know is I have not seen a convincing case either to to demolish it or to keep it. Uh, and I'm I'm not sure that we have you know, a settled methodology that says. This is the regulatory trade, which is what's happening, of course. It may be that you know you're causing a planning and you say it's not regulation, but it is. Uh, you know, what is the methodology by which we all agree that if the uh, embodied carbon in a building is to be lost, then the operational improvement needs to be X, X plus, or whatever the number is. What's the methodology? And by the way, how do you build into that a much more complex issue of business of productivity and business benefit? Life is not just about carbon. Um, uh, in, in the end, most effort probably translates to carbon. Uh, so we need methodologies, and those absolutely can only be digital. Uh, again, back in the in the early days of BIM, which you and I remember all too well, uh, I remember saying, you know, if, if data isn't digital, it may as well be lost because sooner or later it will be. So you would hope that technology. Uh, would would uh, support agreed methodologies, not not competitively offered technologies from house to house, but agreed methodologies by which we measure. Um, and certainly imperfectly at first, by the way. And another thing I said ten years ago repeatedly is, if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. A G.K. Chesterton mm -hmm. quote: "It just meant get started. The perfect is the enemy of the good. As long as you're not making wrong decisions on the basis of an imperfect method." get going, and then we'll polish the method. Yeah. Um, so the technology is essential. You know, we need to start, and, and the great big, you and I know all oh, too well, the great, the next great big challenge, which is to populate models with real data. Yes. 
as opposed to just handling three dimensions, you know, slightly more competently, real data. And we need to have measures of, of carbon. We need to have a carbon economy that has all the same components as an economic, uh, you know, a financial economy. You know, we need to have net carbon added and gross carbon added uh, um, uh, so we can trace things through. Um, and again, you will get a regulatory requirement because there is no point in punishing businesses uh, at home uh, for their carbon output if the alternative is just to import them. So, so, you know, you wipe out your own industries and you import uh, from elsewhere at, at a level which is carbon inefficient and you add the carbon of transporting it. So it, it needs to be thought through. Um, but technology, absolutely an essential ingredient to make sure that we have the data, we collect the data, we disseminate the data from, through, from project to project and down through the supply chain, and that then we, we improve the way that we measure things. But fundamentally, that we make decisions, regulatory decisions, about what the expectation is. Uh, and although I've said, you know, we, we can't just look at government, we need to be clear to government that unless you regulate for a market failure, it will continue to deliver failure. So it sounds, Paul, then, you know, if we're serious about trying to make change and the use of the tooling, the technology such as digital twinning, we probably have to think about data quality being hugely important, probably even at an accountancy grade level to hydrate these models, be it digital twins or machine learning as well. So it sounds like we need to put a bit more governance round about our data going forward as well. I think as well, I certainly concur that if we are going to solve this very wicked problem, we've got to share the data as well, you know, across different agencies, different departments, a better benchmark and actually understand going going forward as well. So do you think, you know, we're starting to see ideas emerging more and more in terms of national digital twins, understanding in real time the impact of our infrastructure? Do you think these step changes are really important in terms of the decarbonisation agenda? Again, yes and no. I mean, the, the, the yes is it's an essential tool. Mm -hmm. The no is I don't think it's going to drive behaviour. It, it's the second question, isn't it? You know, we have to do this thing. We have to reduce carbon consumption by uh, carbon emissions by this amount, um, and we need to do that partly in in uh, embodied, which of course will become more and more important as we get more efficient operation and in operational energy. Um, now, having decided we need to do that, how do we do it? How do we measure it? What are the tools? And I think that's what gets you to the technology. Um, so this is removing an obstacle. It's just too complicated to measure without the technology. But it isn't going to drive the behavior, I don't think. Um, I don't hear people say, I'd love to do this, but I can't find the software. Yeah. Um, so so I, I, like so many things in life you know, around intelligence, artificial or otherwise, um, it, it's a tool, it's, it's not a driver, uh, to, to my mind anyway. Just as BIM will not create collaboration, uh, it, it, it's a means of collaborating for those who are so minded, and it removes the inability to collaborate because you just simply can't find that famous single version of the truth anyway. All, yeah, so you're, you're, you're rolling the pitch, there are new ways of behaving. Uh, so it gets like you know, the 3D aspects of BIM, really, which is, okay, we'd like to do this, but show me the tools. And you develop the tools and people find they work. Uh, and then they start to adopt and improve and increase and so on. And this, we hope they start to change their behavior. But, you know, really in the, uh, what is it, where it is, 10, 11, 12 years since the BIM mandate uh, was announced, how fundamental is the change in people's inclination to collaborate? I wonder. You know, how how, how deep is it? Um, and looking at that probably gives you a realistic view of how long it would take us to uh, take seriously the use of technology to measure carbon. So, so transformational change at a boardroom level. It, when talking about organisational change management again, it just doesn't look. Well, it doesn't feel to me as we're often moving fast enough up there. Do, do you think we've got real leadership? both in terms of ESG and just in terms of industry change sufficiently? Well, no, because where is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the idea of a construction leadership council, you know, the clues in the words. 
uh, but but it's unresourced. Um, and, and I wouldn't be optimistic about industries, a, a demand for industry that it resources it. Um, but that's where the answer has to be. Uh, and, and one's plea to this, you know, and, and I've heard certainly CLC leadership say, we, 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 we don't initiate anything. We can't initiate anything. Well, that's a, uh, maybe a, a fact of life, but it's a curious idea of leadership that you don't initiate and lead anything. So, so the, the, the only magic of the CLC is that's where the only place where we do kind of agree to come together. Yeah. Uh, and I would hope it, to see it become more ambitious in what expects, what you expect, what we expect of each other, uh, and in defining what the right way of, of, of uh, organizing the industry is uh across all the issues we've discussed you know the, the adoption of technology uh environmental responsibility uh, carbon social uh, economic uh, consideration building safety keeping people safe you know we must the, the word i hear most often in the context of grenfell is shocked you know and people are shocked mm. at what uh, uh the play about grenfell calls system failure and it certainly is at what point do we say, as an industry, uh, that we ought to be more than embarrassed? You know, that we don't really want to be part of this if this is its typical way of behaving. And whilst we, there will always be bad apples, you know, we ought to be able to find out where the good ones are. We ought, we ought to have good definitions of what good behaviour is in every sense. Get, get, you know, whether that's ethical, economic, environmental, whatever, what good behaviour is. What the service of our customers really calls for and demands, you know, um, and to deal with this on a, on a, a proactive basis um, and to start marginalising people who don't know how to behave and make it clear that they're outside the pack. And I, I used, in talking to my own competitors in my curious field of quantity surveying, uh, I used to espouse the Tour de France principle, which is um, if all quantities of airs are no good, then clients are going to look for the cheapest. If there is a kind of bunch of people who want to separate themselves from the pack uh, and work together to establish themselves uh, as as leaders, uh, let's do that. I'll race you down the Champs-Élysées for, for the yellow jersey. Uh, because we never do competition out of it, but let's at least try and separate ourselves from it. But I, I don't see where that's happening in construction, where there's a group of people who say, enough, yeah. enough is it. You know, uh, uh, our customers are suffering. Uh, and the, the, in the meantime, we're constantly on the back foot. You know, Rack, uh, this week's story, uh, demonstrates how things are only politically exciting when one side can blame the other for them. Uh, you know, this is a 30, 40, 50 year issue. Um, largely as a consequence, not of the, te of the of the technology itself, if you can call it that, but the way it was done. Some was done okay, some was done badly. You know, wh where do we start to take responsibility for everything in the industry rather than say it's not me? And it's, it, it's difficult when the priority of a boardroom has to be serving its shareholders. You know, that's not an, an unhonorable or dishonorable ambition but it, it has to be their their primary ambition so you need to reframe this relationship too uh, and, and, I, and i think that we need to as an industry agree that we have a construction leadership council and we want to make that mean what it says that it could have plans that plans are resourced that if we really believe in those plans resourcing them collectively would be far more economic than all of us doing it independently and therefore, the idea will be saleable to the industry and so on. Um, but you, you can't really get there with people who give their time voluntarily. Uh, and again, whose first priority has to be to get back to the office and run their own business. So where else might we find leadership? How else might we find leadership? Um, and what does it take to produce an organization that has the ambition I'm talking about, which puts all of these longer term issues involving customers and society uh, at the centre of what we do. Paul, do you think there's any lessons we can learn from the past about change? Uh, and the reason I say this is uh, 
last last Thursday, I, I changed travel arrangements because of the train strike, and someone actually gave me a book to to have a look at, and it was your father's book. And I was like, wow. I said, you know, why has no one ever shown this before? By the way, I did manage to order a, a used copy of it in, on Amazon, sort of, and I, I've read, the, I've got through a fair bit of it now. And I thought, wow, that's about real change within government and within industry. Do you think there's lessons we can learn from the past in terms of how we can make real meaningful change happen, especially within government agencies? Because I feel I have to say yes, because where else might we find you know, uh, means of uh, improving things? But I'm not sure what those lessons are. Yeah. Um, because one thing that has changed, I think, is the political environment, which is probably, you know, whether I'm just getting old and jaded, I don't know. Well, I am. But whether that's the whole reason for seeing the world the way it is. I've never seen anything worse than the current political environment. Yeah. You know, which um, uh, is going back to what a friend advised me when I went into Whitehall in 2009. He said, just remember that the primary business of politics is really politics. Yeah. In other words, it, it's constantly how you score points and get ahead and so on. I don't know that was always the case. Well, we get it, well it was just the same, but we didn't see it. They made a better front of things and so on, you know. But I think most people go into politics because they feel that they can do some good. And then it all kind of goes wrong. And I don't know how you put that genie back in the bottle. Uh, and the only way I can think of doing that is the way I've already described, that, that we, industry by industry, individual by individual, constituency by constituency, demonstrate a better way of doing things that we could do with some enabling by government, as opposed to expecting government just to do, you know, if you, if you read the Times for a week, which I did as a hobby recently, listing all the things that somebody said government should do something about and then you say well oh, how could they uh you know and, and simultaneously we demand a smaller government and smaller white horns less resources and so on and so forth i think that's you know an important a lesson from the past is that we didn't just expect government to do everything you know we had a clear fairly clear view of wh where market failure is you know the, the government's role is to defend the realm and to defend the currency and to address market failure uh, and market failure in its broader sense you know wherever there's social damage done as a consequence of the market not delivering a solution um i think that needs that needs reframing as well so whether we can get back there how you get back there in an increasingly polarized world uh, i'm not sure i just know we have to you know, we can't carry on in a world in which people who don't agree with each other don't even meet and talk. You, know, you, you never find a middle way, you never find a compromise solution, you never find a way ahead. And even people who are similarly uh, aligned on thinking, nonetheless, get back to a competitive way of presenting their point of view so it never comes across as correct. And I, I know that certainly one, one former construction minister told me that he told the industry he would never meet them again until they came back with a single voice. Well, that's probably naive, yeah. but understandable. You know, so, and we certainly need a single voice per issue, a single idea per issue. Um, uh, again, I get back to a CLC. Um, and and, and what, our, what our plan is, on building safety, there's a load of stuff going on, but I can't see the plan. You know, something where the industry can say, this is our plan which will take a long time, which will be imperfect, but which will get make a safer world every day. And that, and its end result will be buildings and products that are safe. We have to take responsibility for that. Um, and that has to start. We have to find a way of doing that in precedence to the immediate boardroom pressures of getting work, making profit, finding staff, dealing with... You know, what Matt Millen called events here, but then the day-to-day -day stuff that, that derails us and so on. Um, I think that's the biggest lesson of the past. You know, how in the in the absence of a bigger government, we can nonetheless secure the results that we would have expected of the bigger government in terms of addressing failure. You look back there to 2009, Paul, you know, with this new role of the, you know, the chief you know, government construction advisor yourself, then Peter Hansford took in terms of trying to bridge that sort of chasm between industry and, and government. To me, at the time, it was a time of, you know, huge enthusiasm and it felt collegiate. 
it felt as if we did have a plan. We, we definitely had a strategy within there. And if anything I do remember was that huge amount of engagement with industry, you know, from the different working groups. Do, do you think that it'd be good to actually, again, you know, recreate that role of the, of the construction advisor again, to create that linkage? I, I think that I think those roles, whatever it's called, that bridge is important. Um, it's uh, a, a difficult role, um, and there is no uh, conceit involved in saying it's very hard to find people who can do it and will do it. Because uh, if you come out of a very powerful uh, PLC environment, you know where you just Captain Picard's style, you just say make it so to your people, and it is so. That's not going to, and you're expecting a car at the front door when you go to your next meeting. That's not going to work. Um, I think that actually, to a degree, having been in a partnership was a unique qualification for the job, you know, where every discussion is a negotiation. Uh, in that case, with the business owners as well as the business, uh, those who work in the business. Um, there's an issue of conflict of interest. I divested myself of every mm -hmm. commercial interest. Um, in the time I was there, um, not just to avoid the conflict of interest, but any possibility of anybody suggesting there might be one. Uh, not everybody can do that. So, you know, you, you have to be at the point of retirement and still have the energy to want to do something to more. So, hard to find people, but my God, if we could, I do think there's an important role not to lobby, which was an, you know, an, an important misconception of what the role was. And I, I've got criticism. Bearing in mind how tough the environment was then, you know, economically, I got criticism for not doing more for the industry in, in, in addressing the absence of work. Well, I never saw that as the job, uh, and I thought the minute it became the job, or the minute I started behaving as if it was, I would stop, I'd lose the audience, and then why? Because there are thousands of people knocking at the door saying, "Give us a job, give us more work, do, pay yeah. us faster, do pay us more, whatever." Um, but somebody who could say, you know, actually, this industry could do more for you if you did this thing, um, and who was trusted to be genuinely interested in what would be a more productive and more valuable industry than just in making work. I think that would be hugely helpful. Uh, and yet what's happening is the opposite. You know, we've lost an independent building regulations advisory committee, um, and we will see consequences of that. You know, they're not being ready advice to ministers as opposed to regulators. Um, and I'm sure that it, this week there have been many calls about RAC. But I don't know where they've gone to. They would have gone to the Britain Regulations Advisory Committee. What do we know about this? What should we do about this? Um, as opposed to just running around headlessly. Um, we seem to be removing sources of, of, of independent, valuable advice. But yes, if you could find the person with the energy and, and the independence uh, and the hard and soft skills, I think there's a hugely valuable job, particularly with a smaller civil service and having somebody who can point to priorities and where the best where where the best change can be made, both in terms of government's behaviour as a client uh, and in terms of, and its role as a sponsor. Critically, not I would say its role as a regulator. Um, I. I steer well clear of that um, because I think that does get you into a very difficult point of conflict if you, your fundamental interest is a better industry um, but yeah I would I would, I would look again um, but I wouldn't be optimistic I think the reason they made the change was they felt they now had the skills internally uh, but with respect not even a very skilled very experienced civil servant has the knowledge and the skills and the experience and the network yeah. and the network was important which somebody who spent a lifetime in the industry would have. Uh, somehow or other, we need to make a bridge so that we can have a conversation that's trusted. And again, that might well come out of a reinforced construction leadership council, which at least has an audience with the minister and could have an audience with more ministers. Um, uh, again, if it's trusted to be uh, independent and to represent more of the interests of the big guys. You think, because obviously construction is still a devolved matter as well, do you think we're doing enough in terms of, you know, across UK to make this happen, you know, all, you know, working sort of, you know, in March step together? No. 
um, that, that, that's that's easy no clearly otherwise we would see the plans we would see the progress yeah. and we would know what we had to do next uh, and that's all I'm asking for really is, is where's the plan yeah yeah and there are there are bits of plans and, uh, and on building safety there's some you know, spectacularly important work going on but but it's disconnected those who are doing the work probably get no credit for it uh, notwithstanding what I say about don't mind who gets the credit um, you start to feel maybe it would be good to have a bit of credit if the, con if the alternative is being told constantly that you're all rotten, uh, which is increasingly the the, uh, uh, the narrative about the industry around the issue of, of construction safety. Um, so no, we're not doing that. And I, and, I, and I get back again to where might that happen? Where might it come together other than a construction leadership camps? It used to be the... the um, uh, Strategic forum, but again, that was that was quite that kind of died on its feet, and the CLC was an alternative to that. At some point, enough major players across the whole series of constituencies of products, design, construction, and then into FM and use need to come together to paint a picture of what a better future looks like, uh, what the behaviour is expected of, of, of the good guys uh, looks like. Um, and how to get from here to there. What's the plan? So you know, that would be my repeated question to anybody who says, what are we going to do about carb? I don't know. What's your plan? And there are, you know, there are bits of plans, there are, but they're not universally bought into. Uh, and as I say, they're, they're in danger of becoming competitive. So we need consensus. We need a, a unified plan. It sounds as if we've probably got the tools, the knowledge, and the skills, but you know, bringing the network together, if if you like, sounds to be hugely important as is behaviours. But Paul, you probably mentioned at the start, you're you're probably at the point where you are probably a bit pessimistic about you know where we are. Can I, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a thought for optimism then. So next generation. So my, my daughter is, you know, she's seventeen. She's about to start university a, a week and a Monday coming. Uh, you know, doing construction, you know, she's done her civil engineer, you know, she's full of change, you know, she's full of, you know, she's a, a digital native. Do you think the next generation next generation will do a better job than us in terms of, you know, trying to steer us to a more sustainable built environment? Well, no, we don't have to wait for them. You know, uh, I, I think my, my major preoccupation at the moment, I, I, we don't have children. Um, uh, but I would have a degree of despair if I think we did. In uh, but I do have a, a degree of concern for all young people. Mm. You know, where is the hope? Uh, for, of, of all these major issues, who is offering hope? Um, I would say to somebody young in construction, for all the problems that we're talking about, for all, for however much better it could be, we're still doing something honourable and worthwhile. You know, uh, uh, and even if we're doing it badly, we are we are harnessing resources for social good. Uh, I was reading for the bar at the same time as I was doing my surveying degree, and I had to choose because they changed the rules. You had to go full time study if you wanted to be called to the bar, uh, and I had to make a decision. Uh, and in the end, the decision was: if you go into the law, you win a case, you lose a case, probably half of each, you know. And it's a bit like doing a crossword puzzle: it's done, and then you know a brief intellectual um satisfaction and then it's gone whereas you know making stuff building stuff this is really important you know this is, this is where we live and move and have our being uh, buildings and, and i absolutely believe in the transformative power of buildings uh, and that will always be worthwhile so uh, there's no despair in that frustration is a better word probably about how much better it could be um and certainly despair is the main at my age the main grounds for optimism are that despair is no way to live you know I just, yeah. uh, I, I just don't want to be you know permanently pessimistic I, I, I couldn't live that way so you you look around for sources of hope uh, and of course you look to young people and hope but they need you know leadership too yeah. um they need a bit more you know more than what the sociologists would call permission to do better um and they need to strike some kind of reasonable balance between setting fire to the world um, and setting for it as it is. That, that, that's difficult. So 
yes, what we do is worthwhile. You know, and, and however young you are, it, it's a, it's. You know, and I don't know anybody in this industry who, for all the fact we moaned about it, wants to be in any other. Yeah. Uh, uh, because it has a product and a valuable product, uh, and well, we make bad buildings, we make a lot of very good ones too, and those, as I say, do enormous, uh, have enormous transformative power. Um, so the frustration is how much better it could be, and the next generation's challenge has to be those things that we haven't cracked, um, which are fundamentally around whether buildings do what they're supposed to do, uh, because we continually just, uh, have a gap between the expectation of a building or its potential, what it actually does. You know, that has to be one of their priorities. Um, whether, whether they uh, perform environmentally well, uh, use the word sustainable, use it what it will, but actually what does that mean? Uh, and how do we get there? We have to, I think, acknowledge that, that we've got the beginnings of that, but we've failed to absolutely deliver on it uh, as a commitment. That's where my hope is, that, that, that young people will not settle, not settle for, for what we hand on, um, and not be uh, cowed by a world in which it's going to be increasingly hard to get a job, in, uh, in a hugely competitive world, um, and that they will harness artificial intelligence rather than surrender to them. Mm. 